Hi, I'm Stanley Goldberg, host of the Inquiring Mind podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're new here, I release two episodes a week with a variety of fascinating guests. And I would appreciate if you would support my podcast by liking this video and subscribing down below. Thank you for your support. And now to today's guest, Nicholas Wapshot. Welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. Thank you, Stanley. I'm pretty uh, glad to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Before we get into the, you know, the ins and outs of your book that I have here, Keynes Hayek, and the new book I have on my Kindle, Samuelson Friedman, uh, which was really good as well. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, I'm a journalist and book author. Uh, I was both a writing journalist, a reporting journalist in politics and economics mainly. I reported the rise of Mrs. Thatcher and the fall of Mrs. Thatcher and the rise of Tony Blair uh, from an office in the Palace of Westminster. So I was a political journalist in the lobby, but I was also an editing journalist. Um, I found that to be able to write the stories that I wanted to write, it was best if I was the editor and I assigned myself to do the task. So uh, I edited the Saturday edition of the London Times. And I came to New York in 2001 and after a short time with the London Times, and after a short time with them, I moved to the Telegraph and then started working for American newspapers and magazines and TV stations. Yeah, and uh, again, before we get into the subjects of your books, uh, what, as, as a journalist yourself for a long time, what do you see the future of journalism being? Well, there's no doubt that it's been undermined in terms of the... Uh, the amount of money that can be made in journalism because now everybody's a columnist, everybody's a writer, and they bung it up on the net and see whether it attracts an audience. But the the democratic end of that, of course, is a very good idea because it means that everybody can express themselves without having to somehow kowtow to an opinion editor on one of the main gatekeeping large newspapers. Uh, the, the difficulty is if you don't sort of semi-monopolize any industry, it can become so dissolved uh, in size that there's not enough money for people of talent to go. So Newsweek, two weeks, two years ago was the last staff job that I had, and I really didn't expect to have another one. Mind you, I said that before I got the staff job on Newsweek. So the jobs turn up, but on the whole, they, they, um, I'm slightly too grand now for doing a jobbing job. On, in journalism. And I, it turns out that writing books, I earn um, slightly more money than I do in journalism. So I'm very happy to write books. And I also have a sideline, which is I work for an investment bank, a London investment bank, which specializes in the sale and acquisition of media properties. And so having been in this business a long time, I do know my way around not only the media landscape, but also I know a great number of the senior personnel. So I can lift the phone to people and say, I've got a client who's quite interested in buying something from you. Uh, despite the fact that you make, you know, more money uh, writing books, is it worth the extra effort? Is it more work than, you know, being a journalist? Oh, no. Journalism is by far the most uh, difficult job to do because it's so wasteful, particularly on a daily. You collect all sorts of stuff and then it's not used properly or it's not used at all. Uh, you know, you, with, with good grace in the morning, you're set out on a task, but come seven o'clock in the evening, the world's changed. And the thing that you've done and worked hard at may or may not be valuable. Uh, if it can be delayed a day, they will delay it a day. And also by definition, if they delay it a day, it's not really news, in which case they're not really interested. So um, daily journalism is very tricky, I think. Do you think journalism would benefit from doing more long, long form uh articles and and research rather than day-to-day -day because it seems to me that when you do day-to-day -day, even though it's you get information very quickly and you get it out there's a high chance that it's not high quality information and we don't know all the facts yet but if we wait maybe i'll give you an example right if you have a you know the the the, the a mass shooting right or something like what happened with George Floyd last last summer? Um, instead of going, you know, this was a horrible thing, and it's being reported. It, obviously, it's a horrible thing, but we don't have all the facts until maybe a month in, and then we can report all the facts, and then people are more well informed rather than getting it piecemeal 
and then you you're convinced it's one way but then most people don't get the information at the very end when they realize that all the things in the beginning were actually wrong you know so wouldn't it benefit to do more long form journalism the thing is that the news cycle which used to be at least 24 hours long is now you know an hour and a half long uh, which means that the churn of news stories is considerable when you get to something big like a mass shooting or indeed the death of you know, murder of George Floyd, the public execution of George Floyd, yes, you can try to, if you can, uh, find as many witnesses as you can and try to compile a story as fast as you can. But actually the story the following day after George Floyd's murder, for instance, has actually got to do with policing. It's got to do with Minnesota. It's got to do with uh, the racial divide in the United States. The Wall Street Journal is a, a great paper in many respects. And one of its standing orders is don't write about what happened yesterday, write about what's about to happen around the corner. So every news story is actually pitched forward. And I think you can do it that way. And then you provide something fresh. The thing is that by the time most people get to you, they will have heard the news on the TV or they picked it up on their phone. If they want to more leisurely read, you ought to give them some sort of uh, direction as to where this story is heading. Uh, one of the other issues that I see with journalism, and I, I was listening to a podcast yesterday with uh, uh, Ryan Holiday, who writes about Stoicism, and uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who's you know Malcolm Gladwell, um, and they were discussing the fact that you know, Malcolm Gladwell said something along the lines of, when he reads an article, and he he's an avid runner, and he knows a lot about running, he reads an article in, I forgot the magazine, and he reads an article about running, and he goes, well, this is this is not this is not accurate, but then you turn around and you, you, you read about the person that wrote the article and they're not runners. They're not athletes. They just, they're journalists, right? So they, they, they don't know their subject very well. They just write based on their research. Um, but then you continue to read the same publication with journalists writing about business or issues in the Middle East, and you trust them, even though you, you didn't trust the person that wrote about running. Um, isn't the other problem with journalism is that everyone is trained to write, but they're not maybe trained in the uh, subject that they're writing about? Well, what they are skilled in or should be skilled in is not necessarily writing because the reporters don't have to write in an elegant way, particularly feature writers do. And it would be nice if uh, American journalists knew how to write automatically is a, a British journalist wouldn't get a job on a newspaper unless they could actually write, that is make sense of something and be comprehensible and have a wide vocabulary and engage people. But that's not a prerequisite here where the world is divided into two. There's the reporting journalist who's actually the, the researcher effectively who collects all the facts. They shove it together in a rough form and it's an editor who will rewrite. The rewrite editor is actually the writer of the story. It's uh, like many things in America, it's doubled up. Um, is that a good thing? Well, the thing is that journalists on the whole, including me, are trained how to, and they choose people like me, who can pick something up pretty quickly and get the gist of it pretty quickly and sound authoritative, even though they haven't had, uh, you know, three years studying at an Ivy League U university on the subject. Uh, there always is the joke in the newsroom that whoever gets to report a story first, you know, the first, if you're here, get out there and report this story. They then become the expert in whatever that story was about, because they do it repeatedly day after day. And there is something about, like the sponge-like ability of a real journalist to, uh, to be able to turn something around. Um, as for, I, I mean, I can't talk about the magazine that you're talking about, because I don't know anything about what, you're, what, of what you speak. But um, the fact is that the, the world, in the way that it exists in terms of blogs and social media, means that people who do have a specialty do not understand things, are able to get access to the airways very, very easily. So Malcolm Gladwell, if he's looking at someone who's irritating him because he doesn't, you know, he's not a runner, but he's writing about running. Well, there are plenty, there's hundreds of runners who write about running. I wonder whether they run very well or whether they've got the, the sort of rigor about fact collection that a real journalist would have. But it, it's, you know, it's bio beware now. It's, it's a jungle out there. As you know, you can't quite tell whether anything's true or false. You can't even tell whether the thing exists or not. You can't even tell where it came from the source, which it says it came from, because there's so much fraudulent behavior. Yeah, I, th I think the issue that maybe Malcolm Gladwell uh, has is not the fact that there's 
the, obviously there are a lot of blogs about running and stuff, but this is a major publication. I, I can't recall what the publication is. Um, and a lot of people will read this article and they will get misinformed because just based on the amount of people that are going to see this article um, rather than uh, a running blog that does that gets a fraction of what this major publication gets. Well, you can't uh, legislate against bad reporting or misunderstand, you know, reporters who misunderstand what's going on in front of their nose. Uh, it's best if you have someone with a bit of expertise in the field. It doesn't have to be absolutely allied to it. The fact is that one is, we're talking about telling a story. The ability to tell a story is much more important in a way than having the um, education in a subject, which Malcolm Gladwell in this case might prefer. Yeah. If, you, if, if an event happens, you end up talking to, you know, very often the six or 10 top people in whatever the field that is, or however small it, an area it is, and you paraphrase them and you bring them together and you try to provide a, a sort of holistic account of whatever happened. Yeah, maybe that, it, that's your problem. I mean, this is going on all, all the time. I mean, this has been yeah. forever. Malcolm himself must have been a journalist who didn't know about the subjects he's now become famous for. Yeah. Um, the the last maybe question I will have about journalism. Are you, uh, have you heard of uh, Substack? No. Uh, so Substack is like this, this super popular, almost uh, blog-like forum where a lot of people that were, either pushed out or quit major publications such as the New York Times or, and some of them actually still work at those publications. They write these kind of periodicals and people can subscribe to them, pay whatever, $5 a month to read their, their articles. And um, what's interesting is you have such a wide variety of very intellectual people on this. Um, and you almost would rather read many substacks than the op-ed of, of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal because the diversity of opinion and uh, the amount of people that are on this and that are experts in their fields are is overwhelming. And you want to get the best information and maybe this is the alternative. The, the other problem is you don't want to pay for too many people. No, I, like personally, I, I maybe pay for two or three substacks and that's $15 a month or whatever it is. But how about if I wanted to read 10? That's just, that's not feasible for me to just afford all these people. Um, it would be great if we can consolidate them and put them into one major publication somehow. But maybe, maybe. I mean, the fact is that people don't always want to be round in their information and to be informed in all directions. They actually quite like the prejudices that appear from their local columnists. I mean, you know, they follow columnists because they think more like them, or indeed they think the opposite of them, so they can get angry every you know, breakfast. So the idea of uh, only subscribing to people who know what they're talking about is um, not necessarily a good idea. As yeah. for people, who, you know, everybody falls off this business. I mean, even, even in the happy-go-lucky days that uh, I've enjoyed, where newspapers were like a sort of gentleman's club. And I say, do say gentlemen because there are very few women in, involved in, when I started off. But now they've become different sorts of institutions altogether. And they do go for clickbait. They do write things short and sharp. Uh, quality products uh, produce sort of tabloid headings and tabloid sections of their paper. People talk about celebrities. They talk about you know rock stars and pop stars and movie stars, the Kardashians. This is all now legitimate for they might dress it up in some fancy way with an arm's length sort of sneer. But, you know, the New York Times has to cover the whole waterfront now because everybody likes to know about everything. Yeah. Um, so maybe to pivot to your books. Uh, be again, before we get into Keynes and Hayek and Samuelson Friedman, what about economics and econom economists appeal to you? Well, which ones? Econ just general economics. Why did you decide to write about it? Oh, I, I'm not quite sure. I was, a, I was a very privileged young man. I won a scholarship to a very fancy school, and I was taught economics one-on-one -on -one, uh, for three years. And uh, very good staff at, at this fancy school. And they encouraged me to try to come to my own conclusions about things. 
And I, rem I remember very clearly the argument that I had about the difficulty of finding a free market, because the free market is always tainted by something. You, there's no such thing as the free market. You know, the, the lost Eden can never be returned to, because you know governments uh, take a large share of the economy. Take the American economy; enormous amount of it is defence spending, good or bad, doesn't really matter. Employing millions of people, you couldn't get rid of that and say that uh, we are going to have a free market in defence. Well, I suppose you could, but uh, I don't think even. The, uh, the more ridiculous of the conservative commentators have ever suggested that. So if uh, the government spends that amount of money and they fix the wages of those people, then they're w fixing the wages of everybody because that's an essential part of the economic climate. And it was, yeah, it was those sorts of arguments. So, uh, so I was able to think, forget the exam that I passed, I, I was encouraged by this guy to ramble around economics and... Um, seek out things which were unusual. And, uh, you know, like a golden retriever, I would bring an, a bird to his feet in front of the hearth. When I found something interesting, then we discuss it. So uh, I came to know about the um, so-called conservative economists, or maybe the conservative so-called economists, um, much earlier because I dug them out in order to find out why I believed that they were wrong. And then, of course, the, the wonderful J.M. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, who invented macroeconomics in 1936, uh, was an Englishman who was still relatively alive on this. He was dead, but, but Keynes was al alive and well. Keynesian ideas were alive and well when I learned economics. And uh, the story of John Maynard Keynes it, it, it is astonishing. This is a man who lived at least two parallel lives and uh, intriguing beyond measure, amazingly smart. And from the very early age, he was trusted by the British government to borrow all the money so that the Brits could find the Germans in World War I. What's more, because the Americans who were coughing up the dough didn't trust the French and the Italians who were on the British side in those days, Maynard Keynes borrowed the money for them too. And he was something like 24. I mean, it, 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 precocious beyond measure, Extra an extraordinary individual. And he was responsible for... For the, in the next 50 years, some of the most important economic decisions that were made in the world in order to try to really prevent there ever being the sort of willful destruction of people's lives that was allowed by governments during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Yeah, as a 24-year-old uh, myself, he made me feel like crap, <laughs> and then, you know, because he, he was a brilliant man. Uh, what's interesting is that Hayek admired Keynes a lot before, uh, for, for, for a while, and then they kind of deviated a little bit. Um, what made you decide to put Keynes and Hayek almost in a conversation in this book? Uh, we, we, this is 2008, the winter off, and uh, the beginning of 2009, and the financial freeze was taking place. And I called up my agent, and said, I'd like to write a book about John Maynard Keynes, who is the solution to this. Indeed, the stimulus and so on was exactly a Keynesian solution to the problem. And he said, well, you can't because, and then he told me that the Keynes's official biographer was writing it. Well, and so was the professor of economics at Cambridge University, which was Keynes's college, Keynes's university in England. So he said, but uh, this, is, this is classic, the, the new world of publishing, don't go for the mainstream, try to find a telling anecdote which you can blow into a book and remembering from my undergraduate days a footnote where it said that Hayek had addressed Keynes and tried to prevent Keynes from publishing uh, intact anyway the general theory which transformed economics into macroeconomics um, I, I, I said to the agent well of course you know there's this famous meeting between Keynes and Hayek and he said that, that sounds fine just send me two pages you know when you when you're done and my goodness, did I rush back to my books in order to try to find out what really happened. And of course, it, it, I, I remembered it right. And it was its simplicity in a way, which was the most interesting thing to me in terms of telling the story, because it was just a, an intellectual duel by learned journal, the most unlikely weapon um, in between two towering figures in economics. And if you think that Keynes changed the paradigm as Einstein and Newton and all these other people changed the discipline in a sort of step change. Keynes was going to do that 
overwhelmingly it was going to transform economics for the rest of time. And this is a case in Hayek of someone trying to prevent a paradigm shift before it happened. So he engaged Keynes in debate and tried to point out the error of his ways. But uh, it was a forlorn hope, really, because first of all, you couldn't stop Keynes. Keynes was galloping, you know, a mile ahead, heading for the horizon. He couldn't be caught up with. And the other thing was that the weapon that Hayek chose, which was Austrian economics, is microeconomics alone. There's no macro dimension to it. And just looking at prices, for instance, uh, or the quantity of money, is not going to help you out when you're dealing with a very complex economy, which you want to manipulate in order to provide more jobs, which is what Keynes said. Provide more demand, that will provide more jobs. And this is how you change demand. This is how you improve demand. Um, and, and both of them, both of them wrote defining books, economics books of the 20th century. I think Hayek is less economics and more political thought and political history. Um, but nevertheless, what role do Hayek and Keynes play in modern economics? Well, as we can see from Biden's uh, stimulus plan, Keynes is alive and well and living in Janet Yellen, who is uh, the Keynesian to the core. And she believes that not only can an economy be managed, but it should be managed for the benefit of as many people as possible. This is, in a way, I think that, that what Keynes did was to side with the Democrats. I mean, not the Democratic Party, but people who were, believe that people should have in, be in charge of their own destiny. And he said, actually, you can manipulate the economy if you want, and you can make it work, work more fairly, you can make it work for more people. But if that becomes the policy, then for the rest of time, we will be able to manipulate it. And Keynes ruled the roost from really the publication in 1936 through the end of uh, the Great Depression, uh, World War II, and the post-war world. Uh, Keynes was entirely dominant, and it wasn't really until the 1970s when there was something which the Keynesians couldn't explain, which was how could you have stagnation and record inflation at the same time, because one was meant to trade off with the other, that uh, the Keynesians got a bit stuck, which is, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's part two of this argument. The first one was Keynes Hayek, and the second one was going to be Samuelson Friedman, who, which looked at stagflation and how that could be cured. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting about the, the the book was the fact that it was it seemed like a, they were in conversation with each other which is uh you know that's a testament to your writing but um would you say that hayek was wrong uh to believe that the road to serfdom was through the welfare state when you have countries for example in scandinavia that have a or and a lot of european countries i would say have a better welfare state than the united states yet it wasn't really, really a road to serfdom. Well, yeah, he, he was anxious really about Nazism. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Nazism was defeated, he was anxious then about communism, totalitarian systems, which would put, which would banish the market. I mean, what the Lenin's revolution of 1917, what it did first and foremost was to say, the free market no longer exists. You may not buy and sell goods without our permission. I, I mean, it's an extraordinary experiment. The fact that it lasted so long is bizarre. Of course, there's an enormous black market because you really can't suppress the market anymore. You can su suppress the tides of the ocean. It, I mean, it is part of humanity. And as long as there are humans around on the planet, they will trade with each other in buttons or goods or whatever they want to trade in, but there will be a market. And so I think that Lenin was on a hiding to nothing. But what Hayek was worried about was that if you gave so much of the state the economy to manage, instead of dealing with the people who actually knew what they wanted and could choose through price mostly, their choice and have their choice delivered to them. Instead, there would be an official in a government department somewhere who'd make all the decisions for people. And he said that that was pernicious and wrong. Uh, what you were alluding to was that one of the great surprises of the road to serfdom. And that is that when it came to it, Hayek said there should be a free market in all things. There should be a level playing field. There should be regulations to ensure that there is a free and fair market. Because if you left it to the jungle, as Ayn Rand suggested, then you wouldn't get a free market. And he said, but, he said, I think that any civilized society 
should expect to house and feed and look after in terms of health insurance its own citizens. Uh, of course, most people who, who say they're Hayekians don't read Hayek. They don't even read the road to serfdom and it's written there pretty boldly. And an earlier uh, proof of the road to serfdom was sent by Hayek to John Maynard Keynes. Despite their differences, they actually remained pretty good friends. Frenemies maybe, but uh, anyway, de decent friends enough to say, here's my new stuff, are you interested in it? And Maynard was very happy to read it, but he said, I've noticed that you have this paragraph where you're saying that actually the state does have a responsibility to its citizens in terms of housing them and feeding them and giving them health insurance. So you have conceded the fact that actually there is a role for the state. So the difference between us actually isn't as profound as you would like it to be. What it is is to exactly where you draw the line between the state and private enterprise. And I'm saying that private enterprise should do everything that private enterprise can do well. But there are many things that it can't do and it can't provide. And that's what the state has to do, because otherwise there will be uh, an uncivilized society. Mm. Interesting. Um, what's interesting is that I saw a little bit of irony when reading the book in, in Hayek's views. And Hayek had this almost utopian view of the world where he... <laughs> No, okay, he didn't have a utopian view of the world, but he he wanted a world almost completely private enterprise. And it reminded me of another utopian view, and that's the of, of a view of Marxism. Um, even though they're polar opposites in terms of ideology, they they were almost moral absolutists, both of them. And did do you see a similarity between um the Marxist view of the world and, and Hayek's view of the world in terms of, not ideology, but in terms of absolutism. Well, yeah, there's a superficial similarity between the two. I think that, uh, however, one is, um, one's backed up by force. I mean, communism wouldn't exist unless people were kept penned in the, their countries or their cities and not allowed to move. Because if you give a communist citizen a chance, they'll leave the country and go to a free country where they can make much more money if they've got any skills. So it really is very undermining of the communist system when that happens. Hayek, though, was a utopian, you're quite right. And he went, wouldn't have anything to do with politics or politicians. He suspected them. He was never hired by anybody as an advisor on anything. And he would advise people like Milton Friedman, don't go anywhere near politicians, they're treacherous people. And also, you're an academic, you don't have to mess with these muddy worlds where promises are made and then broken. So, you know, keep your integrity by not mixing with them at all. But he was anxious because the left had always had a utopian vision shared across from mild socialism, or indeed mild progressive capitalism, all the way through to Stalinism at the other end. And those dreams of, you know, a perfect society that could exist when everybody is healthy and wealthy and wise, and they, in the morning, they dabble in a bit of this, and then the afternoon, they, they're poets, and in the evenings, they paint, and so on. That sort of rich utopia that the left managed to construct was very much envied by Hayek. And he said the problem with the conservatives, the problem with the right, is that they really don't have that vision. And uh, so he called people together in a Swiss ski resort during the summer, Mount Pellerin, and uh, invited as many conservatives as he could find, conservative intellectuals. There weren't many at that time, because the, the pendulum swing was actually heading the other way towards collectivism. But uh, he got them all together and he said to them, the, our problem is that we don't have a shared understanding of where we're heading. And what we really ought to do at this meeting and the subsequent meetings, they met every year and continue to meet every year, uh, we ought to try to develop some of those ideas. The, the result of that actually would blossomed really in the 80s and 90s when uh, conservative think tanks grew and uh, they spawned like mushrooms in Washington, D.C., where conservative academics were paid decently in order to try to fill in some gaps about where conservatism should be and also painted in a rather more dignified light than the opponents of capitalism, who on the whole, of course, dismiss it as a thoughtless, heartless creed. So yeah, he, he was, a, there's no doubt that he was a, a utopian. Uh, not to his um, disadvantage really, because he was not a very practical man. 
the person, if you really wanted to know how to operate the free market, you turn to John Maynard Keynes, of course, who made two vast fortunes. He lost a lot of his first fortune in 1921, but he made it all back within a couple of years. And he, he was rich as Croesus. And his friends in the Bloomsbury Group, Virginia Woolf and all of those writers, they had small pots of money which their parents had given them, like trust funds, but we're talking about a very small trust fund. They now took all of that money, invested it, and kept them all going. So there wouldn't be a Bloomsbury group. There wouldn't be a uh, Mrs. Danforth without John Maynard Keynes. Mm -hmm. And why did you see your the natural progression of uh, from this book, Keynes Hayek, into your new book? How did you see that? that progression? Yeah, it's, it's not exact, because um, although Samuelson is, he is Keynesian, although he spent a lot of time trying to suggest that he actually wasn't quite as Keynesian as people said he was, but he was he was direct heir of John Maynard Keynes. Uh, Hayek, because he was a, an Austrian economist, uh, that is, there is such thing as Austrian economics, which is different from the rest of the world's economics, uh, he, he was in a sort of cul-de-sac, really and couldn't get a job as a, an economist in an American university. Said he stuck to social studies. But it meant that uh, his economic vision really came to an abrupt end when, well, when, when he died, I suppose. But the direct heir of him, really, and the person who met him in Mount Pellerin and became very close to him and ended up actually running Mount Pellerin for a while, was Milton Friedman. So he was the direct heir of Hayek's influence, although Hayek would always say that Friedman and Keynes had more in common than he had in common with either of them. So, but this is the, in, you know, this, this closed world where uh, we see all economists in a bunch of, you know, thinking alike, and, but if you're actually among them, you'd see that some are over at this direction and some are over in that direction. And like every academic discipline, uh, behind the veneer of good manners, there's a, quite a lot of vituperative discussion about why the other why your opponents are wrong. And uh, Hayek would, he was a thug, you know, he was, he was quite happy to go and invite himself to meet John Maynard Keynes and debate with him when he was, when May Keynes was the most famous economist in the world, and Hayek was an absolute nobody, but he had immense confidence and he pulled it off because Keynes accepted the challenge. So in that, uh, Bravura performance, really. Uh, Hayek established, I think, himself as the champion of conservative ideas. And by the 70s, when Keynesianism, as I mentioned before, started running into the sand, because they couldn't explain why such a thing as stagflation should come about, uh, it was Milton Friedman who said, I've got the answer to it, and he, which was monetarism. And he peddled monetarism and did very well with it. He, I mean, he got Ronald Reagan to try it. He got Margaret Thatcher to try it. I mean, he actually got people to try it out on their people. That's about as vivid a social science experiment as you can get if you get a government that actually makes it their principal economic policy and says, this is how we're going to do things from now on. So, so Hayek, I mean, uh, so Friedman didn't take Hayek's advice and he did interact with politicians. Oh, yeah, no, no. Friedman is a totally different sort of character altogether. He was a uh, immensely lively. I mean, both Samuelson and uh, Friedman are extraordinary individuals. Both won Nobel Prizes. They're, they're, they're aged within two years of each other. They both went to the University of Chicago, which is where they met. They were both Jewish. They both had a sim similar sort of background, uh, although one from one part of the country, one from another. And they remained friends from the time they met at the university, which was when they were about 18 or 19, through to when they died, which they did in their 80s. So, uh, and this conversation went on, particularly, I'm glad to say, for my purposes as a writer, it, it, for 18 years, the two of them had alternate columns in Newsweek magazine discussing economics. So if you read all that stuff and flip it like a sort of moving picture, you get quite a, a good sense of uh, Samuelson having to defend Keynes for all those years and Friedman prodding him in the chest saying, but, 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 you're getting it wrong. And very exciting that, you know, Friedman, Work for, for Nelson Rockefeller. I mean, you know, he, he, the wild man of the mountains who Lyndon Johnson destroyed by suggesting he was going to launch a nuclear strike on Russia, which of course was not, not true. But Rockefeller was very much a, 
backwoodsman who thought that the federal government and Washington DC should just keep out of affairs, you know, just do, do the minimum you have to do and leave the rest to the states or indeed to no one, you know, let people make up their own decisions. That uh, Rockefeller tripped, but Friedman was his chief economic advisor and the immediate heir of Rockefeller, thanks to a, an extraordinary speech, it's well worth digging out if you, uh, any of your listeners, viewers, um, could, can find it, it is on YouTube, is Ronald Reagan making the pro-Rockefeller speech. It was so effective that when Rockefeller lost, there was a unanimous view that Reagan was now the candidate that they would be grooming in order to become the next the Republican presidential candidate from the right. It took a little while because Republicans weren't very conservative in those days. They were busy trying to chase the Democrats in order to win the middle ground, which in those days was thought to be the place that elections were won and lost. Uh, Reagan and Friedman, for that matter, said that's not the way to success at all. You should stay to your true ideas. And if you say it clear, clearly enough and persuasively enough, people will understand that actually aping the other guy is not what people need. What they need is a strong contrast and something which would be easily understood. And Friedman's message, like Reagan's message, were very, very simple. Government bad, that's it, you know? <laughs> Um, what's interesting, I'm, I'm actually currently reading a book about the Great Society, and uh, it's it's called the Great Society too, uh, by Amity Schles. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know yeah. Amity very well. She's a very good woman. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually having her on the podcast this week. So, excellent. Uh, excellent. Yeah, what, what's interesting is she starts off the book by saying that in, in with Johnson, uh, you could see that Keynes, Keynesian economics or Keynesian worldview won. And uh, well, she doesn't mention mention Hayek, but you could see the 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 desire to create these government programs and this uh, well, the Great Society, all these government programs and built on the New Deal, um, and then yeah. some uh, said that proved in some ways that Keynes won the debate. But um, now we're learning more about the repercussions of the Great Society and how it had a downside. And some upside, some good upside, but a lot of downsides. So, did uh, Keynes ever comment on uh, whether he approved of Lyndon Johnson's plans or or no? He was dead by 1948. So oh he, he oh wow sorry, but but so do, do you think do you think he would be uh, supportive of his policies? He'd be supportive of the intentions of policies. He might have been a little more critical about whether such policies, which is effectively, this is a war on poverty. This is an attempt to bring everybody up to the same standard in America, which still hasn't been achieved. Uh, what uh, Lyndon Johnson did was just spend, spend, spend. He hosed money at problems. And uh, I don't think that Keynes would have thought that a good idea at all. I mean, he was in, in favor of, at the bottom of a recession, the government borrowing or spending money, even if they had to borrow money, in order to make the bottom of the depression flat rather than deep, which means that people would remain in jobs, even if they weren't doing very much. Do nothing much because the economy can't support you at the moment. We'll be back later when COVID's licked. That's very Keynesian, the fact that it was done by someone who called himself conservative. It's neither here nor there. The option is that, or, or we were talking about people in food lines in Texas, lining up in cars, you know, 200 people at a time, uh, lining up for hours in order to get food parcels. These are people who've never in their life expected to have a food parcel. So uh, times change. I mean, th things, events overtake theories very often and you've got to run to catch up. But I think that, so Keynes would have, thought, of course, you should try to get rid of the worst abject poverty. It's an offense to any reasonable civilized person to see his fellow citizens in such despair. And that's what is what drove him to write the general theory, watching the unemployed of Britain in the 20s and 30s, the millions of them, and said, this is just a waste of human capital. And the government does take responsibility, or should. The government is a patrician organization, or should be. And uh, it's not doing anything at all. And this is what you have to do. 
This is, and this is the logic why spending money, even if you don't have it, will work. You can sort of create money out of nowhere. That's not what Lyndon Johnson was doing. Lyndon Johnson had a lot of money, but uh, he spent so much of it, really to no effect. After the riots, the, the Great Society stumbled. Uh, and then, of course, the, the thing which really did for Johnson was the cost of the Vietnam War, not only in terms of treasure, but in terms of the, the lives lost and the lives wasted. Uh, and for which really, as wonderful he was in many respects, Johnson, a particularly wonderful politician. I mean, if you're a study, he's a politician's politician. If you really like the art of practical politics, you'll never get, never get anyone better than Lyndon Johnson to be able to manipulate other people to go through the lobbies and you know, vote in the right numbers. He knew everybody. He knew their dark secrets. He knew their mistresses. He knew their boyfriends. He knew everybody. And he wasn't afraid to blackmail people in, into voting the right way uh, for fear of you know, the wife getting to hear about the girlfriend, or indeed the boyfriend. So uh, altogether, uh, it was Johnson's sp rash spending, vast spending, that led to the inflation in the 70s, which uh, other people had to pick up, starting with Nixon, who succeeded Johnson, and he immediately ran into an inflation problem. And Milton Friedman was the advisor to Nixon on the economy and had a ready solution for inflation and why its stagnation could be licked. Not that they took much notice of him. Nixon was actually one of the brightest and most intellectually gifted of the post-war presidents, but he was also a politician, preeminently a politician, and uh, along with a, a paranoid side which didn't um, make him very easy to work with, uh, he was uh, determined to get re-elected rather than do the right thing. And uh, Friedman told him that. I mean, you know, it's quite interesting. In those days when the president commanded an enormous amount of deference, uh, Friedman would actually wag his finger and say, this is completely wrong, Mr. President. You know, you're doing absolutely the wrong thing. And Nixon would chuckle and say, you're absolutely right. I know it's the wrong thing to do, but I got an election to win. He was cynical about it. I mean, I'm not trying to sound cynical, but I, I feel like that's most presidents or most politicians they they care most about you know short term gain. They don't care about long term uh, ruin or long term effects as much. I mean, there are a few exceptions probably, but uh, no, you're right. I mean, even someone like Franklin Roosevelt, who had four terms as president, which is astonishing. He wasn't thinking about the fourth term in the first term. He was thinking about how to get the second term in the first term. Yeah, and all you know, four years is a very short time actually. And for members of the House, you know, two years is a terribly short time to achieve anything. You spend most of your time fundraising, and you don't spend much time with politics at all. You spend ringing potential donors with lists of their cats and their children and so on, so that you sound as if you're interested in them. That, that's a, a, a miserable way of running politics, I think. But, yeah. uh, the, 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 vision, the vision thing, as they say, you've got to have a little magic, you know, and I think that Obama had a little magic, that, that word hope, did mean something to people, even though he was very inspecific about it and couldn't be caught out when it didn't happen. But, you know, hope was important to him. Jack Kennedy also had a sense of optimism, which everybody fell in with. Uh, you know, they fell in with the glamour of Camelot and Jackie and all the, the children and the gorgeous lifestyle and so on. And they thought, you know, that's the sort of America that we're looking forward to living in. Uh, but that was abruptly cut short. Uh, Clinton, very practical man. Carter, a very practical man. Uh, I think he did have a Christian vision, maybe, which he was smart enough not to talk too much about. But uh, as we can see by his late life, you know, uh, Carter does good Christian things. You know, he rolls up his sleeves and builds houses for people, even though he's in his 90s by now. Yeah. I, th I think what's, what's interesting about uh, past presidents is there are the you know you just mentioned I I, I do see Carter uh, George H W Bush um, Clinton as very practical presidents I would I would actually say George Bush Jr was also practical more practical I think the impracticality starts maybe with um, Obama and Trump 
it wasn't it wasn't a practical way to run to be political i mean for, for different reasons i think um obama had his reasons and trump had his because he came from a business world where he expects everything to be his way and he never got his way and he was never going to get absolute his way um what, what was interesting to me you just mentioned it before about keynes is he really did believe that uh his nobody in his country should 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 suffer from poverty or or go through or be poor do you think that that it's a very is that a practical dream or is it is it is it just that a dream uh well it's a dream so long as nobody takes it up as a, a an important cause i mean it's a bit like global warming you know for a long time nobody took any notice and suddenly it kicked in because people were upset about it um there's been a lot of good research about the disparity between the rich and poor which only seems to get bigger by the year as time goes on, since the days of Reagan. And I, Reagan, by the way, was a, an optimist. He was a big ideas man, and he wasn't much interested in the practicalities. And he, he would uh, appoint his cabinet and just tell them to get on with it. And if uh, they pulled, were, you know, came up short, then he would fire them. But he himself actually didn't do any running of anything much. He, he, was, the, he was a vision thing, which was, this is a world that, you know, the door... The, America is the shining city on the hill and all that romance that he put into uh, the way that America should become the preeminent country in the world or restore itself to the preeminent country in the world. But what Reagan also did was what Thatcher did. They cursed their own movements by introducing to them dogma. They had a, they had a plan. Now, conservative parties generally shuffle along and do what's needed and fix what the last lot got wrong and try to make things a little more uh, encouraging to private business. But when you have a dogma where people have actually a list of things which you have to agree to before you can even stand as a local councillor, then you, you really are choking off talent and diminishing your party. And uh, Reagan did that. And thanks to people like Milton Friedman, by the way. He, had, he was, a, he was a, well, first of all, he wasn't a conservative, he was a libertarian. Uh, Hayek would say the same, that he's not a conservative, he's a libertarian. But they, they changed their Republican Party into a libertarian party, and it, I guess it is largely a libertarian party today, though people necessarily described it that, but that's the truth of it. And even under Trump, it's a, it's a different form of libertarian party, but it is it's difficult to be entirely coherent about what Trump provided. But, the, I mean, George W. Bush was presiding over a conservative party that he knew to be largely libertarian because they were the people who made up the party by then. And uh, that's, it's, that's a difficult thing to live with if you have a... It's what, what communists would have, you know, you have an official party list of things that you should agree on. Mrs. Thatcher, for instance, was so convinced that uh, Milton Friedman was right about monetarism that she called Milton to, dis to discuss in Tan Downing Street with the finance ministers, what monetarism entailed and what they should do about it, which they weren't very pleased with. She also provided reading lists of people like Hayek and Rand to her cabinet ministers in order to educate them. Well, many of them were very distinguished people <laughs> and they didn't take very kindly to this woman who's telling them to re-educate themselves as a communist might, you know, read, these, read the thoughts of Chairman Mao and you'll come out right. So I think it's been a curse, actually, uh, mm. dogma. The left has always been thought of uh, hampered by dogma, but actually they jettison the dogma as soon as they see any opportunity of getting elected. <laughs> uh, I do uh, have another question, and then that's, what do you see, you know, back in the day, as you just described, you, Thatcher with Reagan, you saw the influence of uh, Milton Friedman or uh, these prominent economists and public intellectuals what do you view the role of economists and public intellectuals in society today i think they're rather more obvious in as much as we know far more about the workings of the white house today than we ever did in say jack kennedy's time when there were things going on in the white house which were not reported which really should have been i mean we're talking about sex scandals <laughs> you know in those days the press was deferential and if they found anything out they would bury it 
as they did with FDR. FDR suffered from polio from the age of 30 and was in a wheelchair. But there were no photographs ever of Franklin Roosevelt during his presidency in a wheelchair. And he was held up by his sons so he could stand up and get, deliver a speech. But uh, that was all kept secret. But now it's sort of, well, Trump is the sort of shining, crowning glory of it all because it, the White House just became a soap opera in the end, didn't it? With people fired or not fired as if they were on some sort of uh, television program that uh, Trump would host. Or indeed they were written in and out like, as a soap opera. If they needed a character, they would get one in quickly. And then when he'd done his business, they would fire him, get rid of him. So there was a, there was a moving uh, circus of people which brought an end to that uh, sense of sobriety, I guess, in White House. But uh, all White Houses try to keep themselves secret. But as time's gone on, journalists have been much more bold and owners have been much more bold. It used to be that uh, the president could call up Kate Graham and say, I, you know, it'd be very helpful to me if you kept this story out. And uh, Ben Bradley would go green and uh, would then argue with Kate Graham and say why it had to go in. But that's the sort of end of the line of that. After that, who? Yeah, so to, to maybe begin wrapping up this podcast, uh, I asked two questions of every guest that I have on. Uh, answer them in whatever order you please. Uh, the first one is what gives you hope for the future? It could be as general or specific. If you have no hope, please let me know. I, I've, had, I've had people that had no hope. Um, and then the second question is what are five books on any topic that you would recommend to people? It could be fiction or nonfiction. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, let's start off with the easy one, which is do I have hope and why? Uh, of course I have hope. I'm an optimistic sort of person. Life doesn't have to be this bad, you know. I mean, it can be fixed. All sorts of things can be fixed. Humanity has within it uh, the ability to make a good life for everybody. And slowly but surely, I'm hoping that progression will be made to, towards, if not the ultimate utopia, at least to a time when uh, people weren't shunned because of the color of their skin or shunned because uh, they didn't have the money to do something which is essential for everybody. So things like health and education should be for everybody. And the fact that it is in theory, but not in practice in the United States, I think is a national disgrace. But I, I can see that can be fixed. Of course it can be fixed. It will take some money and it'll take some good teachers. Uh, and it'll take some very good, inspiring political leaders. And th they're hard to come by. Now, five books. This is very short notice to say five books. I'd, just off the top of my head, if I would count my finger, a little finger off, at least one little finger off, at least, well, at least a notch of the little finger off, uh, if I could have written Lamidia, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, an astonishing piece of work. Of course, it, uh, it writes about something, pedophilia, which is one of the last taboos left on earth. But he does it with such amazing skill, such beauty of elegance uh, in its, his use of English. He's a man brought up in Russia, so he spoke Russian and French, then moved to Poland, learned Polish, and then ended up in the United States where he learned English. But his command of English is astonishing. His vocabulary is so broad and wide. And Lolita, if you just read one book, it'll, uh, well, if you're a writer, it'll transform the way you write. You'll, 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 you'll cower at his ability to make things work. Uh, similarly, I, I'd like um, particularly Great Expectations of Charles Dickens. This is a cinematic writer. If you read the opening chapter of Great Expectations, it's just like the opening of a movie, you know, in the days when they used to have critics over the front. And, uh, and then... It's one of my favorites, sorry, that's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's full of promise and hope and disappointment and criminals. And I mean, it, it has everything in it, as do many, so many Dickenses. But of, of all the Dickenses, I think the Great Expectations is the best. Um, I don't think I would recommend, although he's very readable, I don't think I would recommend John Maynard Keynes, uh, because although he's very readable, it's immensely confusing, the general theory, and I don't think anyone got it right, <laughs> including Samuelson, who wrote about it endlessly. Now, he would say, you know, it doesn't entirely fit together. But many of these great thinkers are partial in the way that they explain things. Uh, 
So I'm not going to recommend that. I would recommend, by the way, Amity Shays, you've got her on. I would uh, recommend The Forgotten Man, which is her account of the Franklin Roosevelt's attempts to interfere with the market in order to put people back to work during the Great Depression. She points out that this is, was done at enormous cost to certain people who were prevented from uh, carrying about their normal business. Farmers were told not to, they were paid not to farm, or they were just told not to farm. They were not part of certain crops where the prices were too high. They were told, don't do it, don't make those anymore because uh, then the prices will come down. Uh, a lot of human rights, civil rights, were removed from people by Franklin Roosevelt. It wasn't just the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. It was a, a lot of businessmen, small businessmen, sh shopkeeper, you know, small corner store open, uh, owners, and so on. And it's also a very combative book because the conventional history, of course, is that Franklin Roosevelt uh, put everybody back to work and cured the Great Depression. He puts that in a different life. It's very elegant. And that's the third book. So I can run around reading the same books. I, um, for instance, read uh, Evelyn War endlessly. Uh, so, of those, Vile Bodies is a wonderful story about the collapse based upon Evelyn War's own collapse of his marriage, about the collapse of the marriage. A Decline and Fall, his first book, is very funny. These are all comic accounts of the world between the wars in, in London, and uh, they are hilarious. And, and again, it's the style which is so apparently effortless, which is what I give enormous credit to. You, can, you have to slow yourself down, it's so beautifully written, so that you enjoy seeing how well he does it. It's, it's invisible. But I also read uh, Raymond Chandler. so. The Big Sleep, almost any, I mean, they're almost interchangeable, really. But The Big Sleep is a very good one to start on. And uh, this is, a, as you know, an American Californian uh, taught in Dulwich School in London, but didn't leave much English impression on him. He invented the, you know, the private eye is private eye, Philip Marlowe, who's uh, haunted movies ever since. But the writing itself is just hilarious because his understand, uh, understanding of the way that crooks speak to each other and uh, the things they do to each other, uh, all told through the, this sort of rather absent-minded uh, private eye who won't wear a gun. Uh, that's fascinating. So I, got, I mean, I could go on for a week telling you things to, to write, to read. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Um, Nicholas... I really, really, really appreciate your time, and um, uh, I, I highly recommend this book that I have here. I wish I had the other one to hold up as well, because but it's on my Kindle, and it's not as impressive to hold up as a paperback. Um, it looks right like that. It says Samuelson Friedman. It, Samuelson a, Friedman. He's a Googleable title. Google, exactly. Well, and and the, put a Keynes in the Google, and I said it's called Keynes you idiot. Samuelson <laughs> <laughs> Friedman, same thing. Yeah, and I will link these on the bottom of my uh, YouTube and Spotify and everywhere else it's going to show up. So I highly recommend people buy these books. Uh, thank you for your time and all the best to you. Great pleasure. Thank you very much.